A few weeks ago, I was in uh, uh, a committee meeting with a group of people, uh, uh, two Americans, uh, one Hong Kong, one Chinese, one Brit, uh, one Dutch uh, person, and uh, we're on this committee, and we're in Vladivostok, uh, Russia, which if you haven't been there, it's north of North Korea. Uh, and uh, so we're sitting there, and we're on this committee where our job is to try to give input to um, the Moscow School of Management, which has a small project to allocate several billion rubles, actually hundreds of billions of rubles, to um, Russian universities to see if they can take more universities into 21st century ways of thinking, new ways of thinking, new ways of organizing, new ways of structuring, new ways of making things work. They have 1,100 public universities in, in Russia, 75 in Moscow alone, more than 50 in um, uh, St. Petersburg. In fact, in St. Petersburg, just to give you some sense of how creative engineers are in, uh, you know, kind of closed economies uh, as Russia has been uh, trying to get out of, there is the St. Petersburg State University for Electrochemical Engineering, the St. Petersburg State University for Electrotechnical Engineering, the St. Petersburg uh, uh, State University for Electromechanical Engineering. Uh, every, and this is no joke. Uh, there is uh, St. Petersburg Polytechnic. I think there's at least four schools that have that in their name in one way or another. They're Polytechnic of A, B, C, or D. Each of them have a president. Each of them has four or 5,000 students. Each of them is fighting to be the greatest university in the planet. Each of them will never achieve that because they have no idea, no idea whatsoever what innovation is, none. They've become, and these are things I tell them, I'm surprised they ever asked me to come back. And so <coughs> they sent me 30 proposals, and I evaluated them on a train dry, riding around in Morocco a, a couple summers ago with my wife, and she says, why, why are you muttering to yourself in words that aren't very nice? <laughs> I said, well, I've got 30 proposals here, and 29 of them are uh, not going to be successful, and one of them I can't read. And so, uh, <laughs> and so the point is, uh, uh, I'm sitting in Vladivostok, and um, I get on a plane, and I'm going to Waukesha for my next meeting. Now, Vladivostok to Waukesha is quite a trip. So, so Vladivostok, you've got to fly around North Korea. You've got to land in Seoul. You can't fly. If you go over North Korea, who knows? And so then you, you land in Seoul. Then you get in Seoul, and they say, well, next stop, Seattle. I'm like, can I get to Milwaukee? Uh, no, not from Seoul. Uh, but you can get to Seattle. OK, so I get to Seattle. Then I have to go from Seattle to Chicago. Apparently, Seattle, Milwaukee. I don't know about that. Can you get Seattle and Milwaukee? You can? <laughs> Apparently not at that hour. And then, and then <laughs> Chicago to Milwaukee, and then a guy named Tom picks me up at the Milwaukee airports and dri drives me to the Kern Foundation facility in uh, Waukesha, and um, where uh, a team from ASU is uh, there. It's about 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. And it was kind of an arduous trip, and I was unbelievably excited to have made that trip. I was sitting in this place. I really, it was dark, I couldn't even see where I was. I, I was somewhere in the country. I, there were like trees and there was like, the city kept getting further and further away and then, and then pretty soon we're in like this, this kind of house and they said, well, you're gonna sleep here. I said, okay. <laughs> There's rocks, yeah. And so, but let me tell you what I was excited about. There are few organizations, few places, few groups of people that have figured out the magic parameter that makes the difference. It is unbelievable to listen to politicians or listen to leaders and they're talking about this and they're talking about that and they're jabbering about this and they're jabbering about that, but they're never talking or jabbering or even focused on those things that are, in my view, the key parameter, the most important thing. And so if you want to change the world, and I've thought this for a long time since I was an undergraduate student in, in several disciplines at uh, Iowa State University where I was really a javelin thrower, but they said I had to go to class. And so uh, 
I've really thought that at the end of the day, it's the engineers and what we engineer and what we design and how we design it and how we design it to fulfill our dreams as a society. It's really this group of individuals, these engineers, broadly scoped here, who have more in their hands in terms of the outcome of our civilization than any other single group. I, I learned this once when I read a story about who'd save more people, engineers or doctors. And I thought, well, who wrote this? Some kind of idiot. You know, uh, doctors obviously saved all the people. And they said, no, doctors haven't saved that many people. Only about half the people that go to doctors actually have positive outcomes. And so, and so it's literally the case. Uh, but who changed the world in terms of human survivability were engineers who mastered the movement of water, the cleanup of water, the, the uh, engineering of the cities, the designs and conceptualizations of things. And so it was unbelievably exciting to me to be able to have a chance to go to Waukesha and sit and talk about how we could become a part of this really, really, really important project, this project about how do you create a mindset shift in engineers, in engineering students, in engineering faculty members. How do you, how do you create engineers who can conceptualize that they are the designers, architects, and implementers of the constructed, built environment in which all of our social, all of our political, all of our all, everything that we want to do, everything that we want to be is a product of what they can put together as the platform through which the rest of society operates. So there's this notion in the idea of sustainability called the built environment. You all know what the built environment is. That's what engineers construct. And so there's a famous economist by the name of Herbert Simon who really wasn't an economist, but he won the Nobel Prize in economics even though he wasn't an economist and didn't really write about economics in the way that people think, but nonetheless he won the prize because he was that good. And he wrote a book called The Sciences of the Artificial in the late 1970s. Anybody read that book? A couple of people? Yeah. Design science was the theme, it was the theme, and it was this notion of there's sort of two parts of the universe. There's that which we've been given, nature, and all of its glory and its beauty and its wonder and its power and its assets and its tools. And there's that that we do with it. Scientists help us to understand nature, to unravel each of the elements of its character so that we might see how it works. And engineers are the masters of design who create the artificial from the natural. The artificial is what we construct. If you take that to its extreme then, that the world that we live in, the chairs that we're sitting on, the room that we're in, the air that we're breathing, the temperature that we're feeling, the clothing that we have, the machines that made the clothing, you all know this or you wouldn't be in the room. Every single thing about us is a product of that design process, that engineering process. Now imagine if engineers were more entrepreneurial, we're more driven by an, uh, a set of, of character objectives, outcome objectives, outcomes. We wanted society to be a certain thing. We'd like, you know, we'd like to start, stop talking about all of the issues in Africa. We talk about them, we talk about them, we talk about them, we talk about them. They are design problems at the interface between the built environment and the designed environment that can be altered if we can only find the mindset, the way, the method, the tools, the techniques, the ideas, the mechanisms to design different outcomes. And so even how we think of everything, what is a material, what is food, what is water, we have a small project from a local engineer, another kid that grew up here in Phoenix who got his undergrad at uh, ASU, went off to MIT, uh, Lori went off to Caltech, came back, was on the faculty. Uh, uh, Cody Friesen is this guy's name. And so Cody's got these machines right now over in Jordan. And there's nothing new or exciting about this other than no one's ever done this in quite the way that he's done it. He's got these really advanced uh, solar uh, uh, powered mechanisms which are, are extracting water 
uh, at, the, at the sort of sub nanoscale into uh, 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 local uses uh, just from the atmosphere. Not a big deal until you see how he did it and at what cost he does it, which is no cost. And so the point is that even the idea of water and where water comes from and what it can be and how it moves forward is all a function of can engineers become socially sophisticated? It's supposed to be, you're supposed to be laughing now. <laughs> Somebody else is saying, what does he mean? <laughs> that is aware. Imagine now engineers not just learning calculus which is essential to think in multiple dimensions, not just learning thermodynamics, not just learning you know, all of the laws and the systems and the rules and all of the science necessary to be these great designers, but adding to that design entrepreneurism, social consciousness, character, broadening the parameters. And so the most exciting thing about me being able to go to the Kern Foundation that day and then being able to be a part of this uh, program and this project today is really a function of the fact that this small group of people focused on this one parameter in the equation of human success, the production of engineers who think differently, are probably as important as any gathering of people on any topic anywhere ever. Ever. Everybody thinks somehow that the big show is on Wall Street or that the big show are these people in the banking industry who seem to have forgotten how to count or play by the rules. The big show isn't in high finance. The big show isn't in global geopolitical systems. The big show is who can develop, design, and advance systems, tools, ideas, and solutions that help human beings to have better lives. Who can do that better than engineers? And this is the thing that engineers, I think, understand and grasp, but not quite in the same way that perhaps they could. And so this foundation, I think, is in a sense, in the, in the old adage, if you go to Robert Kennedy's grave, how many of you have been there where there's the little ripple maker where the ripple dropped a, a, a little thing into the, into the water and then this ripple effect occurs? This is the ripple. The ripple's being started with this group of people here. So this is what's exciting. So today, what I want to do today is talk about um, a little bit about organizational change within academia. So I don't know how many, how many of you are a part of an academic institution. All of you or nearly, nearly all of you? Yeah. So I don't know why, but you all are a part of some of the most structured, rigid, bureaucratic, non-changing, non-creative, incapable of altering your own trajectory institutions. It is unbelievable. And so here we are, I think we're producing on sort of a, we're out producing anyone that's came, come before us and so thankfully that's the case. But maybe we're at sort of like a 30% efficiency level in what we do, maybe, maybe. You know, we still think that a class, 50 minutes. Where did that come from? I saw, I saw people literally pass out in the back when Lori said they had seven week academic <laughs> modules. We can't do that, the faculty wouldn't vote for that. They like the 15 week schedule. Where did it come from? No one knows. Literally, no one knows. What does the word semester even mean? I, I defy, I mean, you can look it up in the dictionary, but you tell me what it means. So this morning I woke up and I put on this watch my wife gave me a few years ago. It's a fantastic watch. It actually simulates the rotation of the earth. It actually thinks there, that, that each of the units of time on here are a second and a minute and then minutes and then hours. It's unbelievable. There's a thing on there that tells me what day it is. <laughs> now, the watch that they gave me when I got here to ASU, or when I was at Columbia, more, this was a watch, this was like the watch they gave me on arrival when I became uh, one of the provosts at Columbia University in 1991. It was a watch that only clicked every semester. 
And so it always looked like there was a lot of time left. <laughs> you know, you'd go five or six clicks, and little did you know that that was three years of Earth time. Because literally, we'd talk about things. I mean, in fact, we talked about, this goes to this notion of bureaucracy. We talked about the fact that we wanted to increase the size of the freshman class at Columbia from 975 to 1,025. Seven years. That was debated, argued. Faculty were going to quit probably should do away with the engineering school so that we could fund the other schools. This is not, I'm not making any of this up. And so literally inside an institution, struggling over unbelievably simplistic things without giving consideration to this larger set of design questions about who we are, what we are, what we're doing, and what our role is. So, so Kern has kicked the bucket, found people that they can collaborate with and network with, that can network with each other and collaborate with each other under the hope that we will create a wave of change under the hope that different engineers by the hundreds of thousands will be produced in the hope that the world ends up better off than we've gotten so far, and it's not like we haven't made huge progress, we have, but how do you do that inside an academic institution? So I'm gonna bore you a little bit with that relative to us. So we've been working the last few years, I've been here almost 14 years in this, in this job. You know what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to be a college president, stay around for a few years, get in a bunch of arguments, and then leave. And then have somebody in the physics department say, yeah, well, you know, we'll take care of the next person when they get here also. <laughs> and so I think it's better just to outlive them all. <laughs> and so we've been working on this idea, the new American university, it's kind of funny, a lot of people get offended by that. They say, what do you mean new American university? What's wrong with the ones we have? Well, nothing other than their rigid, structured bureaucracies built on social constructs around ideas that somebody thought up four or 500 years ago that are less relevant today than they used to be, but other than that, they're okay. Uh, and so, <clears throat> New American University is not meant as a replacement model, it's meant as an additive model. So there are four waves of change that have occurred in, in uh, American higher education. I won't walk you through all of it, but wave one, the colonial colleges, wave two, Harvard, Princeton, King's College, which became Columbia College, Bowdoin, where I used to be a trustee. I don't know if anybody's here from Bowdoin College, but I used to be a trustee of that college. That's in a place called Maine, <laughs> Brunswick, Maine, which used to be a part of Massachusetts. Everybody says, no, that's not true. I said, oh, yes, it is. And so uh, uh, the second wave were public colleges. Nobody even knew what the word research meant. They knew what scholarship meant. They didn't know what research meant. University of North Carolina, South Carolina, Michigan, University of Virginia, those were the early ones. The third wave was the land-grant schools. The fourth wave was the research schools uh, and uh, lots of variations along the way. The colonial colleges, often then new models of those, engineering schools, specialty schools e evolved in the first wave. A number of first wave schools became research schools, a number of public, public colleges became research schools, a number of land, grant, but land grants became research schools, not all. Uh, and then uh, some whole cloth research schools, Stanford, Chicago, Cornell, um, uh, schools like that, created from whole cloth, Hopkins, just built from nothing by uh, local donors and local communities into uh, research universities from day one. Uh, we're suggesting, and I'm using this not because I'm suggesting that anyone follow this path, per se, I'm not. I'm here to talk about how you, how you build character-driven, change-oriented, innovative ac academic institutions, period. And so we are attempting to be a prototype for what we call wave five. Large, scalable, high-speed, highly innovative, highly adaptable, uh, highly technologically empowered, research-grade universities with unbelievably diverse student bodies. 
We think that there's some need for that in a country of 320 million people. Uh, with, uh, by the way, most of you might not know this, that the, there's about seven or 800 public colleges. How many are at publics? I think not very many of you, a few. The graduation rate at public colleges is going down. It's averaging now under 38% uh, and declining rapidly. So you got problems, big problems right here in River City. And so the notion was we needed a new design. The key to design, the key to character-driven academia, the key to innovation is design for what? Too many of our charters, too many of our raison d'etres, too many of our logics are generic. Generic. They're all the same. You could just scratch out the word and put one college in, put in the other college, scratch out the word, put in one college, put in the next college. So we derived this charter, a comprehensive public research university measured not by whom it excludes, but by whom it includes and how they succeed. Measured by whom it includes versus who it excludes and how they succeed. Now some of you will say, well, that's what we all do. I'm going to show you that's a little bit different. And again, it's not so much, I'm not trying to give you the story about ASU as much as the story about the how, how to facilitate change. It's this, this is, this is the raison d'etre. This is the identification of self. This is the, in the, in the logic of, of organizational theory and the logic of organizational change, the identification of self. The reason for existence, the purpose for existence is absolutely essential. Advancing research and discovery of public value, which means if it's not of public value, we're not going to do it. You can, but public value is across a long continuum of, continuum of time, but there won't be a lot of navel gazing unless the navel gazing has some purpose. And then lastly, and importantly, very importantly for us, assuming responsibility for outcomes, social outcomes, health outcomes, economic outcomes, community outcomes, assuming responsibility, at least in the realm that I'm in and, and, the, and the experience that I've had, it's often the case that colleges and universities step back and they say, oh, it's just really so sad that the local community that we're a part of has a 38% poverty rate. So there's a city called New Haven, Connecticut. What's a big college in New Haven, Connecticut? The one that starts with a Y. They have blue and white and they look like bulldogs and they, uh, anybody go there? Anybody go to Yale? One guy? <laughs> And I'm not picking on them, but they've been there for like 300 years. So if you'd been there for 300 years, what would you think that community would be like? You would think that that community would be like the exemplar of, of the way the world would someday ultimately be. Wouldn't you? I mean, just thinking about it theoretically, you'd step back. I mean, like they'd have, you know, they'd be like, zero carbon footprint, you know, somehow telepathically communicating with each other, uh, social construct, I mean, everything imaginable. And people say, oh, well, there's that whole thing about money. Well, yeah, there is, and then there isn't. But the point is, is that if the university doesn't feel that it, or college doesn't feel that it's responsible, we sort of took on this idea of responsibility when we thought about teacher education. So we started out as a teacher's college uh, back so not, not so long ago when uh, we, we've only been a university since 1960. We've only been a research university roughly since 1990. Been attempting to be a research university only since 1980. We didn't give any degrees until 1925 because we were just a territorial teacher's academy. So we have at the heart of this place a teacher's academy spirit. We were producing, just a few years ago, 1,600 new certified teachers a year. They're going out into a community, and the community was not doing well overall in K through 12 outcomes. Well, whose responsibility is that? 
Well, according to the people that were running our college, it was somehow some idiot at the legislature's responsibility. Somebody, it was somehow related to how much money was made available to K through 12 education. I'm like, yeah, well, that might be a factor on a list of 10 or 12 or 15 parameters, but I would weight the heaviest and most significant parameter around the teacher produced, the capability of the teacher produced. And so we took it upon ourselves. We dismantled our education college in its entirety, exited 45 faculty members from that uh, college, acquired resources, structured a whole new entity, created a teacher's college, acquired about $125 million of new resources from multiple sources, public, private, mixed, everything that you can imagine, and are in a slow and arduous and complicated and difficult process of rethinking the very purpose of our teacher's college, the very idea of how we produce a teacher, the very idea of who's attracted to becoming a teacher, because at the end of the day, it's probably the case that the teachers and the engineers will likely have these unbelievable outcome effects on our overall society. But I'm just giving you this a sense that it turns out at the end of the day, we were responsible. Of the 1,600 teachers we produced before we began making these changes, 42 were certified to teach math. Now, it's often funny and I'm going to give you some other data on this as we move through this. It's often funny that people talk about, well, they're all math-phobic. A lot of people are math-phobic, thanks to the mathematics teachers. <laughs> well, think about this for a second. The English language is mastered by most as young children. The English language itself is more complicated than anything in mathematics. Much more. More variables, more uncertainty, more complexity, yet it's mastered. Mastered. Why is it mastered? Well, one, it's essential. It's taught from birth. It's an integral part of everything that we do. Math, not so much. By the way, we, we've, we've changed lots of things. I'm going to tell you why we've had to change them as we get into this. And so again, it's this notion of the essential thing is the essential question, why are you here? Why do you exist? Why, why, why? What is the aspiration of your organization? Your aspiration cannot be we're, we're going to be a good college. Your aspiration can't be, we're going to be ranked something. Who cares? Literally, who cares? I can give you the parameters for rankings if you want to know what they are. They have to do with age and money. Anybody believe that? Nobody? Nobody raised their hand? Oh, a couple people. Smart ones over here. <laughs> so the key, the key, the key is having some kind of reason for existence, which is anything other than generic, for which you can be held accountable, for which there can be measurements to your accountability. So that's one thing. Well, how do you do that? So in our case, we outlined design aspirations. These are pathways, pathways to the why. And in our case, these design aspirations, and there's nothing new about this stuff. It's perhaps new at the scale that it's being applied. It's perhaps new in the way that we're applying it in an academic institution. We do have 3,000 faculty members. I have to work with the faculty on all topics, all issues, get buy-in, move forward. This is, you know, this is not a, uh, an institution which is not uh, engaging the faculty in the governance of the institution. So we came up with eight design aspirations, ways in which we would think about the why. Absolutely, if you do not have elements of character and elements of outcome aspiration in your raison d'etre, you will not perform at a level necessary to create change. You'll just be a factory producing widgets. Well, I got four new mechanical engineers. They look really bright and shiny. 
Okay. That's not good enough. It's not enough. But how do you get there? So we came up with eight of these. Leveraging our place, where you're located is really, really important. The community that you're embedded in. Transform society. This notion of catalyzing social change. This goes to, now imagine all of this applying to engineering schools, all of this applying to engineering realms. Transforming society. So all engineering schools transform society. How many engineering schools have transformation of society as an objective? See some hands. Lori put her hand up. Couple. What school is that one? Dayton. Which one? Dayton. Okay, Dayton. Where else? Over there? ASU. ASU, okay. <laughs> so transforming society as an aspirational objective. If you set it as an aspirational objective, you've got to now start holding yourself accountable for that. And this is where engineers, they get really nervous because it's hard to measure. It's hard to measure. I, I should mention that I was not an engineering student, but I took a lot of engineering courses, which was like, like a form of sadomasochism. <laughs> so I took a chemical engineer, two chemical engineering courses from a guy named Tom Wheelock at Iowa State. So I'm in this laboratory and I'm counting various macerals. Anybody know what a macerol is in a coal structure that you're looking at under a microscope? So you can do a predictive model of the various chemical constituencies from the original plant material from which the coal was actually derived. Anybody done any of that fantastic chemical engineering? And then you build a plant to separate those macerals based on you know, uh, specific gravity and all kinds of other factors that I didn't, wasn't really sure what that all meant. And so, uh, and so in all of this, it's really hard when engineers are so focused on making it work, you know, the landing gear has to work. The jet must fly for 10 years with only occasional repair and keep everybody alive. The lunar landing module must land on that spot. There's so much that goes into that that everything else that seems to distract from that or pull away from that is seen as a distraction. And I think that We've sort of mastered that to the extent that what we need to be doing is broadening our logic, broadening our parameters, thinking about transforming society as an aspiration, thinking about, in, in our particular case, valuing entrepreneurship. So the, anybody from Oberlin College here? So my wife went to Oberlin College and I gave this talk once where I was bad-mouthing Oberlin College and and the president happened to be in the audience only. I, I don't think I knew that. And so it wasn't that bad. I just said that the word entrepreneur was not always a welcome word at American colleges, like Oberlin. <laughs> and it was true. He says it's less true now. But the point is, entrepreneurship is what? Entrepreneurship is the ability to advance ideas toward a particular outcome and to acquire the resources and the material and the means and the mechanisms to advance those ideas. It's not about starting businesses only. It's not about, it's not about that. It can be about social enterprises. It can be about solving problems. It can be about all kinds of things. And so what we decided to do was to make that an aspiration of the institution across all of our colleges, all of our programs, everywhere. I won't go through all of these, but I will say that, that uh, fuse intellectual disciplines and enabling student success, you'd say, well, yeah. So a lot of you would say, well, yeah, he's got student success somewhere up there, like fifth or something like that. Please don't, don't say things that are quite that silly. You know, it's, it's, it's the notion of enabling student success for us means, and I'll show you in a second, enabling student success across a student body which is not handpicked across a student body which is not handpicked. Now you've changed our entire way of thinking. It actually is the case, by the way, that if you want engineers to have a greater and deeper and broader impact at designing the world in a different way, they better be as completely representative as society. Men, women, backgrounds, family backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, whatever it happens to be. Right now, they're not, uh, not even close. And we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So 
So fuse intellectual disciplines, we put that up there. We eliminated 80 academic units. And so here's the point, not OASU eliminated a bunch of academic units and they lived to talk about it. It's not so much that, it's that if you're not changing, 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 adjusting, driving forward, <coughs> your output will remain the same. Your output will remain the same, whatever it is. Numbers, types, quality, mindset, you must change. And so we decided that we were going to make one of our aspirations fusing intellectual disciplines. So we did away with geology as a department. We did away with astronomy as a group. We did away with astrophysics as a group and astrobiology as a group. We brought them all together with a group of design and systems level engineers. We brought them all together into the school that Lori uh, mentioned, uh, and she used to be in our geology uh, program, uh, of earth and space exploration. We formed another school built around sustainability, which is an outcome-oriented school, fusing disciplines together. It has 350 faculty members involved in our Global Institute of Sustainability from over 40 disciplines. Each of these, by the way, are monumental intellectual debates and struggles and everything that you can possibly imagine. We did 80 eliminations and 30 new designs, and of the new designs, 16 were these discipline changes, these intellectual transdisciplinary enterprises. We used to have three biology departments. Anybody have biology departments? Yeah, they weren't any good. They weren't able to be adaptive. They weren't fast. They couldn't move things in new directions. So we said to them, we're going to give you a clean slate. Go out and rethink biology. Come back and tell us what you wish it could be, not what you inherited, because you don't even know what it is. You're just running a biology department like the same person runs the post office. And your faculty members are the letter carriers. And they service the students, and it's this equation of just bureaucracy. So they came back with a brilliant design. Ten years later, 3,000 undergraduate life science majors in a school of life sciences with scientists, engineers, philosophers, ethicists, policy analysts all in there. Again, it's not the story about ASU. It's about this notion of taking control of aspirations towards specific unique goals at specific unique institutions or networks between and among institutions, like the Keene Network. And by the way, we increased the research activity in that same faculty by a factor of five. 3,000 undergraduates, hundreds of graduate students, and a five-fold increase in research just from design changes. <coughs> and so people think, out there that some of these things are interesting. We did like to, this uh, ranking that we just got, number one in innovation ahead of Stanford and MIT, anytime we can beat, particularly Stanford, we beat them in women's basketball yesterday. <laughs> very, very exciting. I'm glad we did not play them in football this year, so we play them every other year. Uh, so I'm not gonna walk you through all of this. I'm going to use a particular example here about specific missions and goals, and you've all got missions and goals and strategic plans and so forth and so on. We don't have any strategic plans. We don't have any strategic planning documents. We don't have any strategic planning committees. We've never been through a strategic planning anything. What we have are things we're trying to do, mission and goals. So we have these aspirations moving toward our charter. And then we have these mission and goals. So one is to demonstrate leadership in academic excellence and accessibility. This, by the way, and I'm gonna, this is the, the one little thing I'll put as a little actual ASU commercial. This has been abandoned by the major research universities in the United States. Abandoned. So our admission standards at ASU are the admission standards of the University of California at Berkeley and Los Angeles in 1950 and 1960, almost word for word. That was, if you have a B average, you took specific courses to prepare you to do university level work, and you had a B in those courses, you're admitted. That's it. That's the admission requirement. Oh, what about the high schools that are no good? Well, that's not the kid's fault. People forget this, this is not the kid's fault. The kid just went to the high school. I went to four high schools in the 10th grade. That was not my fault. It's a true story. It wasn't the best experience in the world, I can tell you. So 
demonstrate leadership and academic excellence and accessibility. The point here is the setting of goals, the holding of one's identity to those goals. So if we're trying to build a network for change, a network to produce a new breed of engineer, we're trying to diversify with our society to empower our society and enable global change and American success and demonstrate all the things that we're trying to do, well, those have to be specific goals. It can't just be, what well, we're going to just have some engineers. And so, again, specific goals. So we have specific goals. Number one, up there at the top, maintain the fundamental principle of accessibility to all students qualified to study at a research university. Again, I'm not harping or pushing this as the goal for you. I'm just suggesting when you set that as a goal, and you make that then a part of where the institution is going, it changes everything. Now you're accountable to the attainment of that goal. Right now, we're not, right now most colleges are not admitting who's qualified. They're admitting, they're admitting those that can afford it, who meet some standard of selectivity to allow them to maintain some social status within a hierarchy of institutions. Period. And there's nothing evil about that. It's not particularly socially productive. It's not going to actually enable us to produce the kinds of engineers that we need to produce in the future, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So maintain the fundamental principle of accessibility to all students qualified. And then second, maintain university accessibility to match Arizona's socioeconomic diversity. So 20% of the people that live in Arizona come from families with incomes under $25,000 a year. 20%. So we have 60,000 undergraduates on campus. That would mean then if we're going to match the socioeconomic diversity of the state, what is 20% of 60,000? An engineer said 12,000. That would mean 12,000 of our students have to come from families at the poverty level or below. 12,000 of our students do. In 1990, only 3% of our students came from Pell-eligible families in 1990. So we had 11,500 freshmen this year. 46% are students of color. 42% are Pell-eligible. Across 11,500 students. And then we also take about 10,000 community college transfer students each academic year for 21,000 new face-to-face, -face, full immersion, technology-enhanced learners that actually represent the first two bullets up there. So again, it's not the ASU story. I don't really, I'm not trying to push that. I'm trying to basically put, put action to model, action to model, action to model. The model says, let's do that. So Keen Network has things like this outcomes that they're pursuing. That's an outcome that we're pursuing. And so let me tell you something else. So improve freshman persistence to 90%. Most of your schools have freshman persistence above 90%. When I was at Columbia for 12 years as a faculty member, as an administrator, we had unbelievable fre freshman persistence. We took only the upper 1% of the high school class, handpicked each of them for their previous demonstrated success. So we admit of our freshmen, about half are incoming A students and about half are incoming B students. Guess what? Ain't so easy hitting 90% freshman persistence from those socioeconomic backgrounds. I might add on the side, this model now allows me to be able to say to you that we produce more Native American graduates than all members of the AAU combined, the Association of American Universities than all campuses of the University of California combined. Because we let in every single student that meets our admission standards from whatever high school that they attend and then we greet them and, and embrace them. So let's just talk a little bit about engineering in this context. <clears throat> so in engineering, we set out, and uh, Kyle Squires is here, our interim dean of engineering and vice dean of engineering back there, and there's a few other. Who else is from ASU engineering here? A few other people? Yes, who else from ASU that's here? There's some other people. Jimmy Choi from our Office of Knowledge Enterprise Development. So our engineering team and our university, 
they're unbelievable what they've been able to achieve. So just, in fact, Kyle, I'll just let you say, how many engineering students did we have just a few years ago? And how many majors do we have now? 19,000 majors in engineering. And we have, if that's just 2,000 of them are online and 17,000 or so are face-to-face -face full immersion technology enhanced learners. That's the phraseology we're using. Full immersion on campus technology enhanced learners. Of the 17,000, call that a doubling of the number of engineering students. It was a tripling of the diversity of the engineering students. And what happened in freshman retention? And it was 68% when we started this process. Now, how do you do that? Now, again, it's not the story about ASU. The story is about this notion of innovation and change, innovation and change, driven towards goals, driven towards objectives. So look at just one, two, and three. One, you're going to maintain an admission standard that's actually the admission standard for your institution. What does it actually take to be successful? Number two, you're going to have a student body that's representative of the entire diversity of the state. And number three, you're going to have a freshman retention of 90%. You notice I don't say 90% in some subjects. We have 300 plus undergraduate majors, 400 plus overall combinations of these majors, 90% across all of that. And so the reason that I'm belaboring this or walking through this is this notion of if one wants to produce a new kind of engineer, if one wants to grow a new kind of engineering faculty member, if one wants to produce engineers who are fundamentally different in how they view the world and look at the world and how they move forward, you must step back and look at everything. Raison d'etre, design, outcomes, goals, measurements, and hold yourself accountable for those things. So back to Kyle just for a second. He didn't know I was going to call him. So do you have any goals that you're working towards now, or have you achieved everything? But what, what are you working on right now as the interim dean? Well, right now, uh, so once we get the goal of the ASU, we'll kind of set that up. And let me just add that going back to a design aspiration, the engineers, as much as they might want to be, uh, kept free from this fusing intellectual disciplines process, kept free from that. That's not something that you like design a new school and then you walk away and then it's all done. So we did away with all 11 engineering departments. We created five grand challenge engineering schools around the ideas of Chuck Vest in particular when he was uh, president of the National Academy of Engineering. We added to that a polytechnic school we went to a multi-campus setting. And now we've then built other schools around engineering and other institutes around engineering, one of which we launched just uh, this semester, or just last semester, which is our new school for the future of innovation and society. And we've allocated about 10 or 15 new faculty lines in addition to the faculty that we already have. And we haven't put this in engineering yet. And we might not put it in engineering. We might put it in engineering. Haven't decided yet. Going back and forth. We have it out on its own right now, just kind of incubating. We hired a bunch of faculty from the University of Michigan. We play them in football here coming up pretty soon. Need to beat them, too. Jim Harbaugh, anybody know who's that, who that is? <laughs> so Jim Harbaugh played in the Rose Bowl, 1987. He was beaten by ASU. You remember. <laughs> yeah. Lori, was, Lori was here, and that's why we won. And so the reason I bring, up, the reason I bring this up is, is uh, this whole notion of, of continuous innovation, continuous change. The new school for the future of innovation in society has as a goal to get a couple thousand engineering students as minors to begin shaping and rethinking the way that they think. And that school is now made up of social scientists, physical scientists, behavioral scientists, 
engineering policy people, engineers. It's non-disciplinary. It's a theme-oriented, outcome-oriented school. And so let me summarize by saying that, that the process that I'm trying to describe is a process of what I call mindful design. Mindful design. If we want the Keen Network, if we want the Keen Network to work, if we want engineering schools to be, to continue to be, to be e even more, more impactful, more powerful, more change-oriented, to produce the kind of social, economic, and cultural outcomes that are derivative of the design, then the design process has to be mindful, and it's not an inherited design process. Each of us in our own individual settings, each of us in our own individual schools, each of us in our own individual places have got to move from the mindset of manager to the mindset of designer, to the mindset of architect. And so uh, I think that there is an unbelievable opportunity for this network to do things that have never been done before. But that will require all of us internally, and I know we're, we're willing to do this, to continue to look at ourselves, to design and reconceptualize that of which we are, and more importantly, what we want to be and what we want to achieve. So again, what I wanted to do today was just give you a context and give you some insights into how this process has worked here, this mindful design process. And with that, let me open it up for uh, comments or questions.